Existence of an Equilibrium for a Competitive Economy by Kenneth Arrow and Gerard Debreu in Econometrica in 1954. Kenneth Arrow received Nobel Prize in Economics in 1972. Awald has presented a model of production and a model of exchange and proofs of the existence of an equilibrium for each of them. Here, proofs of the existence of an equilibrium are given for an integrated model of production, exchange, and consumption. In addition, the assumptions made on the technologies of producers and the ta tastes of consumers are significantly weaker than Walls. Finally, a simplification, simplification of the structure of the proofs has been made possible through use of the concept of an abstract economy, a generalization of that of a game. Introduction. Leon Varas first formulated the state of the economic system at any point of time as the solution of a system of simultaneous equations representing the demand for goods by consumers, the supply of goods by producers, and the equilibrium condition that supply and e uh, equal supply equal demand on every market. <clears throat> it was assumed that each consumer acts so as to maximize his utility, each producer acts so as to maximize his profit, and perfect competition prevails in the sense that each producer and consumer regards the prices paid and received as independent of its, his own choices. Varas did not, however, give any conclusive arguments to show that the equations, as given, have a solution. The investigation of the existence of solutions is of interest both for descriptive and for normative economics. Descriptively, the view that the competitive model is a reasonably accurate description of reality, at least for certain purposes, presupposes that the equations described the model are consistent with each other. Hence, one check on the empirical usefulness of the model is the prescription of the conditions under which the equations of competitive equilibrium have a solution. Perhaps as important is the <clears throat> relation between the existence of solutions to a competitive equilibrium and the problems of normative or welfare economics. It is well known that under suitable assumptions on the preferences of consumers and the production possibilities of producers, the allocation of resources in a competitive equilibrium is optimal in the sense of Pareto. No redistribution of goods or pro productive resources can improve the position of one individual without making at least one other individual worse off. And conversely, every Pareto optimal allocation of resources can be realized by a competitive equilibrium. See, for example, Arrow 1 and Debreu 4, and uh, references given there. From the point of view of normative economics, the problem of existence of an equilibrium for a competitive system is therefore also basic. To, the, to study this question, it is first necessary to specify more carefully than is generally done the precise assumptions of a competitive economy. The main result of this paper are two theorems stating every uh, th stating very general conditions under which a competitive equilibrium will exist. Loosely speaking, the first theorem asserts that if every individual has initially some positive quantity of every commodity available for sale, then a competitive equilibrium will exist. The second theorem asserts 
the existence of a competitive equilibrium if there are some types of labor with the following two properties. One, each individual can supply some positive amount of that at least so one such type of labor. And two, each such type of labor has a positive usefulness in the production of desired commodities. The condition of the second theorem partially uh, particularly may be expected to be satisfied in a wide variety of actual situations, though not, for example, if there is a uh, insufficient substitution, substitutability in the structure of production. The assumptions made below are, in several respects, weaker and closer to economic reality than a waltz Unlike his models, ours presents an integrated system of production and consumption which takes account of the circular flow of income. The proof of existence is also simpler than this. Neither the uniqueness nor the stability of the competitive solution is investigated in this paper. The latter study would require specification of the dynamics of a competitive market as well as the definition of equilibrium. Mathematical techniques are set theoretical. A central concept is that, that of an abstract economy, a generalization of the concept of a game. The last section contains a detailed historical note. Historical note. The earliest discussion of the existence of competitive equilibrium centered around the version presented by Cassell. There are four basic principles of his system. One, demand for each final good is a function of the price of all final goods. Two, zero profits for all producers. Three, fixed technical coefficients relating use of primary resources to output of final commodities and four equality of supply and demand on each market let x sub i be the demand for final commodity i p sub i the price of final commodity i a sub i j the amount of primary resource j used in the production of one, uh, one unit of commodity I, Q, J, QJ, the price of resources, resource Q, uh, J, and RJ, the amount of resource J available initially. Then Cassell's system may be written X sub I equals to function of sub I of P sub one all the way up to P sub M. And the summation of A sub i j times q sub j through j should be equal to p sub i and summation of a sub i j times x sub i uh, all the way up to uh, through i should be equal to r sub j for all j. Professor Nasser remarked that the Kasselian system might have negative values of prices or quantities as solutions. Negative quantities are clearly meaningless and, at least, in the case of labor and capital, negative prices cannot be regarded as acceptable solutions since the supply at those prices will be zero. Nasser also observed that even some variability in the technical coefficients might not be sufficient to remove the inconsistency. Stackelberg pointed out that if there were fewer commodities than resources, the equations three would constitute a set of linear equations with more e equations than unknowns and therefore possess a general, in general, no solution. He cons uh, correctly noted that the historic uh, economic meaning of this inconsistency was that of that some of the equations in three would become inequalities with the corresponding resources becoming free goods. 
He argued that this meant the loss of a certain number of equations and hence the indeterminacy of the rest of the systems. For this reason, he held that the assumption of fixed coefficients could not be maintained and the possibility of substitution in production must be admitted. This reasoning is incorrect. The loss of the equations 3, which are replaced by inequalities, is exactly balanced by the addition of an e equal number of equations, stating that the prices of the corresponding resources must be zero. Indeed, this suggestion had already been made by Professor Zoyton, see, uh, through, though not in co connection with the existence of solutions. He argued that the resources which appeared in the Kasselian system were properly only the scarce resources. But it could not be regarded as known a priori which resources are free and which are not. Hence, the equations 3 should be rewritten in as inequalities. Exclamation of a sub ij times i sub i all the way up through i should be less than or equal to r sub j. With the additional statement that if the restrict inequality holds for any j, then the corresponding price q sub j should be zero. Schlesinger took up Zoyten's modification and suggested that it might resolve the difficulties found by Neisser and Stackelberg. It was in this form that the problem was investigated by Walt under various specialized assumptions. These studies are summarized and commented on in 23 article. From a, a strictly mathematical point of view, the first theorem proved by Walt neither contains nor is contained in our results. In the assumptions concerning the productive system, the present paper is much more general since Walt assumes fixed proportions among the inputs and the single output of every process. On the demand side, he makes assumptions concerning the demand functions instead of deriving them, as we do, from a utility maximization assumption. It is on this point that no direct comparison is possible. <clears throat> the assumptions made by Vault are somewhat specialized. One of them, interestingly enough, is the same as Samuelson's postulate, but apply to the collective demand functions rather than uh, collective demand functions rather than to individual ones. Vault gives a heuristic argument for this assumption, which is based essentially on utility maximization grounds. In the same model, he also assumes that the demand functions are independent of the distribution of income, depending solely on the total. In effect, then, he assumes a single consumption unit. In this second theorem, about the pure exchange case, he assumes utility maximization, but postulates that the marginal utility of each commodity depends on the commodity alone and is a strictly decreasing non-negative function of the amount of that commodity. The last clause implies both the convexity of the indifferent map and the non-saturation with respect to every commodity. This theorem is a special case of our theorem 2 prime. When P is the null set and D contains all commodities, Vault gives an example under the pure exchange case where competitive equilibrium does not exist. In this case, each individual has an initial stack of only one commodity so that theorem 1 is not applicable. At the same time, only one commodity is always desired by all. 
but two of the three consumers have a null initial stock of that commodity. Hence, theorem 2 prime is not applicable. It may be added that Vault has also investigated the uniqueness of the solutions. This has not been done here. Thanks for listening.